Did you know that you don't always have to follow the instructions of a sewing pattern? Today, I'm showing you an easier way to sew a dress. Honestly, I started filming this video with the idea of framing it as a how to follow a sewing pattern and make a dress video. But I ended up kind of hating the instructions so much that it is now a how not to follow the instructions of a sewing pattern video. In this video, I'll be walking through how I modified the pattern to fit my body, um, considerations of the print placement for this pattern, and lastly, how I put the dress together. Throughout this video, I'll be highlighting the different between the pattern instructions and the way that I sewed the dress with this icon. So every time you see this icon, you gotta pay attention. This is my second last project of my autumn winter capsule wardrobe sewing series and I really can't wait to put everything together and show you how the capsule looks. Without further ado, let's make some magic! This is a brand new pattern that I've never used before this project. So I started out by cutting the pattern pieces I needed to make my dress. In my opinion, this is the most annoying part of sewing. Next, I adjusted the length of the front bodice. Using a measuring tape and starting from the shoulder point for size 4, I measured and found that the length of the front bodice for this pattern is 42 and a half centimeters. The length of my body at the front is 41 centimeters. So I adjusted the length of the front bodice to my body measurement by folding it along the lengthen slash shorten line printed on the pattern. So to make sure that both my front and back bodice pattern pieces will match along the side seams, I also took off 1.5 centimeters for my back bodice pattern piece. Before cutting the fabric pieces out, I also gave my paper pattern and the fabric a quick iron so that everything will lay nice and flat for the cutting. So the fabric that I'm using is a green plaid on a white background with some little hearts and pine trees and snowflakes and a red print. I didn't really try to match the seams for the front and back bodice along the side seams, but when placing the paper pattern on the fold, I tried to make sure that the checks are kind of symmetrical on both sides along the fold. Based on the finished garment measurements provided by the pattern, my waist measurement sits around size 8 of this pattern and my bust measurement sits around size 4. So when tracing the side seam, I started at size 8 and slowly tapered towards size 4. I traced size 4 for the armholes and the collars and the shoulders and everything else for the pattern. When cutting the front bodice piece, I left a little bit more fabric where the bottom of the French dart is. Because after shortening the pattern, the French dart actually ended up looking super confusing and I wasn't quite sure how it's supposed to look. So I just kind of grossly traced out a dart for size 4 and left a little bit more fabric so I could just trim the excess later than worry about not having enough fabric where that corner is. The size of the skirt pattern piece is rather big and I couldn't fit it on my cutting table so I cut out the skirt front and back pieces on the floor. Other than shortening the bodice pattern pieces, I also had to shorten the skirt. Since folding the circular hem would be kind of tricky, this is how I did it instead. First, I traced the pattern piece out. Then I cut the pattern out along the waistline and the side seams. Then I marked out my new shorter hemline using a measuring tape and a tailor's chalk. For my height, I decided to shorten the skirt by 3 inches so that it would sit uh, roughly where my knees are. <laughs> So at some point, I was really tempted to just abandon the skirt pattern piece for this Vogue 8811 sewing pattern and pull out my own half circle skirt pattern with the center front and the center back piece so I could make a chevron design on the center of the skirt because this fabric is a directional print. I really wanted the pine trees to be standing upright. But 
I didn't have enough yardage, number one, and number two, it's a pretty narrow fabric as well, so I couldn't manipulate this skirt pattern piece to make the pattern be right. I thought long and hard about it, and there was just no way for me to get it the way I really wanted it to, and I have part of the skirt where the pine trees are just like fallen over. <laughs> So that was just my little soapbox on the tragedy behind the skirt print. And here are all the pieces that I cut to make my dress in view A. Did you see that? Did you see that I actually cut the print upside down for this bodice piece? Leave a comment and let me know if you actually saw it from a mile away and share one of your silly print cutting stories with me as well. Okay, let's give it another go. We have the front bodice here and of course the wretched skirt pieces. And now it's time for us to sew the dress. Sitting right at the very beginning. The pattern actually wants me to sew stitches and then ease the front and back of the bodice together along the shoulders before sewing along the shoulder seams, which I didn't quite understand because the front and back were the same length along the shoulders. So I just sewed the shoulder seams together without any easing at all. And then I looked at the next step and realized that if I were to sew the bias tape accent um, with the shoulder seams of the bodice sewn, I would have to do mitered corners on the center front, center back, and along the two shoulder seams, which felt like too much for me. So I decided to unpick the stitches along the shoulder seams, then sew the bias tape on. So this main part of the video is really just devoted to the construction of the Vogue 8811 dress. Um, but I'll be sharing some tips on sewing this bias tape accent at the end of the video. After adding the bias tape onto the front and back bodice pieces, I then stitched them together along the shoulder seams and got the bias tape to match up. With two tries. <laughs> Now I almost forgot to mention this really important thing about the shoulders. This dress is actually designed to have shoulder pads added, but I didn't want to have shoulder pads added, so instead of sewing the shoulder seams along this original stitch line, I actually ended up sewing it along this line instead, which would take away the, the space that was drafted in for the thickness of the shoulder pads. Next, I sewed the darts. The pattern actually wants me to slash the French darts on the front and press the dart open, but I didn't feel like there was a lot of bulk along the French darts on the front, so I just pressed it and left it as such, like a, a normal regular pattern. After that, I sewed the front facing and back facing together. The pattern actually says to finish the raw edge by folding it about a quarter inch towards the wrong side and then just stitching it down. But I usually like to use bias tape to finish the raw edge of uh, facing for a garment, which is the method that I used for my 70s floral blouse as well. Um, I just find this method a, a bit like more fun because the um, guts of the garment is a little bit more interesting. And also I have so much bias tape that that I made for making this bias tape accent on this dress so I decided to go with my regular bias tape method. So once I finished the facing piece for the neckline, I sewed it to the bodice of the dress right sides together, then trimmed the seam allowance and understitched the facing. At this stage, I also decided to put the bodice on just to have a feel of what it looks like and to decide if I needed to make any adjustments. I was really happy with how it looked and I didn't end up making any additional adjustments. Next, I sewed the front and back bodice pieces together along the side seams, cut the underarm area so that there's a little bit more freedom and movement, and trimmed off that weird French dart bit that I talked about earlier. Part of the left side seam is left unstitched as the opening of the dress. 
I prepared the armhole facings the same way as the instructions. But remember how I made that adjustment to the shoulder seams? I had to make the adjustment along the underarm stitch line of the armhole facings just so this facing could fit my new diameter of the armholes because of the shoulder seam adjustment. After understitching the armhole facings, it was time to get working on the skirt. The pattern actually suggests to sew the side seams of the skirt, then apply the lace trim, which in my case is the bias tape trimming, and then sew stay stitches along the waistline. I didn't like this sequence of events very much. Anytime I have to manipulate a skirt, pattern piece with a circular waistline. I like to sew the stay stitches first before really just moving it too much because circular waistlines are very very delicate creatures and if you disturbed it, it will stretch and pull and go out of measurement. I sewed the stay stitches along the waistline first, then I added the bias tape, and then I sewed the skirt pieces together along the side seam. It's looking good! And now it's time to attach the bodice to the skirt. The pattern actually suggests to fold the seam allowance of the waistline towards the wrong side, then baste it down, and then stitch it to the bodice with the seam allowance folded down. So this is a technique that I've only seen in vintage patterns, and I just was not in the mood to do this, so I just chose the more direct and modern method of pinning the bodice and the skirt right sides together, aligning them along the side seams, center front and center back, and then clipping the curved waistline and and stitching them together. When it came to sewing the extension flaps to the side opening of the dress, I sewed it pretty much as the pattern says for the front flap. But when it came to the back extension flap, the pattern says to leave the short ends, the excess bit of the ends, and then stitch it to the front of the dress. But I Instead, I decided to fold the extra bits in so that they have a nice folded finish. And instead of um, using hand sewing to slip stitch the extension flap to the dress, which I already did for the front, I decided to stitch the back flap to the dress with my sewing machine instead. I also sewed a short row of mini zigzag stitches at the top and bottom ends of the side opening to reinforce those areas. And then it was time for some hand sewing. Wanna guess how long it took me to finish this part of the dress? Close to an hour. <laughs> I ended up using bigger snap buttons and a bigger hook and eye closure for my side opening and only used three snap buttons along the side opening of the bodice and two snap buttons along the opening of the skirt. After letting the dress hang for 24 hours to let the bias sag, meaning for kind of like the bias cut skirt to fall into place, I finished the circular hem by stitching a seam binding tape along the raw edge and then hand sewing the seam binding to the skirt with blind hemming. Also, I almost forgot to mention this, but I actually top stitched along the waistline to give the dress the look that the pattern intended it to have with this step. And just a few more finishing touches before I called the dress complete. I added a button from this vintage button card that I've had in my stash for the longest time, just waiting for the right project, and hand sewed a loop to go along the back neckline and secured the facings to the main part of the dress along the shoulder seams and I was done! So if you're thinking about using the same bias tape accent for this exact sewing pattern or for your own sewing project, here are some tips. Number one, I found that having the bias tape laying wrong side up and laying flat on the pattern piece helped me to figure out where to fold the bias tape to create the mitered corner and which angle to actually 
so the bias tape for the mitered corner. If you're afraid of your tailor's chalk or the tracing paper leaving marks on your fabric like me, it is actually useful to sew basting stitches along where you want the bias tape design to go and then using that as a guide when sewing your bias tape. The bias tape that I used is a half inch wide single fold bias tape and so initially I had a lot of issues with the bias tape actually going right into the uh, you know that area under the needle I don't that hole I can't remember the name of it but what I found was um, having a piece of paper under the bias tape when sewing the mitered corner really helped in preventing that from happening and number four last but not least try not to stretch your bias tape when sewing and to make sure that you have enough room on your sewing table to have the fabric and the bias tape laying flat and not pulling. So I hope you've enjoyed my little sewing project for the week. I want to stress that I don't hate instructions of Big Four sewing patterns. In fact, I learned through sewing Big Four patterns when I first started out sewing. But I think it's also important for us to recognize that there is no right or wrong way to sewing. The right way is the best way that works for you and the result that you want for your garment. I also recognize that the sewing steps in the sewing pattern is true to that specific era of sewing and while I don't necessarily want to replicate all the steps from one to I don't know how many, I do still really enjoy using vintage finishing techniques like using the seam binding to finish my circular hem, hand sewing the button and the loop and also using snap buttons and a hook and eye closure as the closure for the dress instead of a zipper. If you like retro inspired style and sewing, you should subscribe to my channel because that's mostly what I do around here. Thank you for watching and I will see you again in the next video. Bye!